Welcome to the Maintainable Software Podcast, where we explore the art of improving existing software with seasoned practitioners who have helped organizations overcome the problems often associated with technical debt and legacy code. I'm your host, Robbie Russell. On this episode, I'm Ed Waspy, who is currently a software development manager at Amazon and also coaches software developers who have recently been promoted into management. Ahmed joins us from New York City. Ahmed Wasfi, we're so glad to have you join us on Maintainable. Welcome. Thank you. I'm uh, glad to be here. Thanks for having me. So as you reflect on your experience in the industry, what do you believe are a few common characteristics of, dare I say, well-maintained software? <laughs> Starting right off the bat with a controversial question. Well, I mean, I, uh, I don't claim to have sort of a, an exhaustive list, but I think some things that come to mind, you know, as soon as you ask that question, first and foremost, it needs to serve a purpose, as in, you know, what value is this software adding? What kind of business metric or business goal are we going after? And, and working backwards from there, you know, how, how do you track that that goal continues to be achieved and continues to be a success? So that's, that's one. As long as you're achieving that, then that means you're doing something right maintainability wise and then there are different ways and kind of achieving that maintainability in my opinion you can generally you need a good balance of sort of new feature development and um, maintaining kind of the existing code base um, you need some way of you know tracking and, and, and uh, monitoring what's going on um, metrics operations and, and some sort of rigor around the process of actually maintaining that and then finally you know the biggest real aspect is the people aspect of it. You need to make sure you've got a continuous pipeline of folks that understand that system, uh, a way to train new folks um, on that software. The hardest part is, you know, striking that balance of keeping them sort of interested in it and actually interested in continuing to develop it further. Do you have a distinction between, does, does legacy code mean something to you or do you feel like you talk about that very often? Is there, and where would you kind of like draw that line in the sand between it's between legacy and whatever we call software before its legacy? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think I've ever actually thought about that definition in, in a ton of depth. Uh, I, I suppose, you know, in any code that's been around for a few years, you could you could argue is, is already legacy code. I've worked in, in, in some languages that are not used externally, for example, or not used as much. But I imagine, you know, someone who's writing Fortran code would, would call that proper legacy versus... Um, an old C++ code, say. Hmm, interesting. And one of the things you also mentioned in, in the previous topic was related to you know people and being able to have people come into the project and join it and get trained up on it and have context for it. Like, what are some examples of where you've seen that gone really poorly, bringing new people into an existing legacy, whatever you want to call it, source code, where maybe there's not a lot of uh, people that were around when the thing was in you know the inception of the project and they're coming in. How, what, what, what kind of things have you kind of seen pop up over the years? Yeah, I mean, I've, there's a ton of examples. I've, I've got one from, you know, one of my own kind of personal experiences at, at Amazon. So Amazon was big on these, or at least uh, used to be big on these big hiring events where they go to a particular city or and do a big hiring event where they'll get tens or hundreds of engineers hired out of that event. You know, there's a bunch of reasons that Amazon tries to do that. It's simpler, it's quicker. You could fly the interview team, interviewing team and uh, have a bunch of candidates lined up. They'd usually prep for these sort of months in advance where recruiters would start spamming folks in the region. And then depending on where you are, sometimes there's online assessments to kind of filter. But it depends on how you look at it. One of the one of the bad outcomes out of that is, and I've had to do that personally, is you get an entire team that is uh, starting from scratch that is essentially was hired through the one of these events and in my in my particular example i had to ramp up that team in a in a different city uh, than the core team that had the expertise and the knowledge so i had some like eight or nine engineers that i need to ramp up different levels of experience which makes a difference but they're still all new to the company only to the code base without any local experts to to help them through it so so i've seen that one i, I wouldn't say it was it was horribly bad but it was definitely an uphill battle that we probably um, could have planned for better. Yeah, I don't think I've ever, you know, I've never worked at that large of an organization, but it sounds like a job fair type thing, and you bring in a bunch of people after that that might make it through, and then you all of a sudden you have a, a satellite office or something in a different city now, and like how do you then get them up to speed on the company culture? 
and the software in tandem. And I wasn't anticipating asking this question, but it makes me wonder, like, during those scenarios, how much of an emphasis do you feel like there was on finding the right type of people to be at somewhere like Amazon versus just having the coding skills necessary to the work that Amazon needs them to do? Like, did you feel like that was, there was a good balance there for that type of like distinguishing the type of people you're looking for? Right. Yeah. No, I, I, that's actually a good question. I, I don't think so. Uh, I, I think it was more of, you know, passing a, 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 the hiring bar, you know, you know how to code, you know how to design a system, you know, typical kind of data structure and algorithms kind of skill. Uh, I don't know if there was a ton of thought put into sort of individuals and what teams they'd fit in. Um, but, but at the same time, I think Amazon and other large companies have this problem where it's really hard to find talent and, and maybe that's, you know, one way around that. It's, it's, uh, you gotta pay, you know, you gotta pay it off somewhere, right? It's kind of like tech debt, you know, you, you can take it consciously and then pay it later, but you get some sort of advantage. And with, with that case, maybe it addresses some of the hiring challenges, but at the same time, it makes for a slightly harder ramp up and then it's sink or swim from, from there. And, and clearly that has worked for Amazon, um, so far, but, hmm. You know, as a software development manager, what's your take on the usage of the metaphor technical debt? Do you use it often in your day-to-day work with your team? I, I do, actually, yeah. Uh, although I, I, I don't think I've, uh, I think I mostly inherited it from, you know, just being in the tech space for so long. And, and I don't think I ever sort of questioned my, my use of the term where, and now until you ask that question. Yeah, I mean, I mean, we, we don't really think about it as, as debt in the sense of at least having seen that be very common you know, you could take that to, you know, get a mortgage and a, and a home, and most people are okay with that. Um, and most people seem to have a negative reaction to the word tech debt in general. But um, very few kind of look at it more holistically of trying to balance uh, kind of both sides of, of the equation. For this type of work, you know, where maybe your team is highlighting things that, whether or not it's technical debt or things that they want to, like some issues or concerns that's maybe introducing some lag into the process or, you know, kind of slowing things down or, um, they knew that a decision was made, they compromised on something at one point, but they knew you would come back to it hopefully in the future. What have you seen work well for those teams to, to track and organize that type of work and ensure that that does happen versus like kind of hoping and crossing your fingers that one day there'll be this magical someday, maybe that it eventually shows up. That that would help. Yeah, no, that, that's a very good point. Cause I think I've, Establishing uh, a system where where engineers trust that that one day would come, or would actually continuously, ideally, continuously, you know, doing some work on on that you know technical debt backlog enables, in my opinion, enables them to to make faster decisions as well. Because a lot of the time, you you know, decisions could be stuck in this kind of limbo of uh, how good or how perfect you want it to be uh, from a from an engineering standpoint versus you know, you know how practical and and kind of product or business is pushing um, for, for a tighter deadline. And establishing a process helps the engineers make that decision a lot quicker, knowing that they, they trust that the process works. I've seen a couple of big models. One is this kind of, um, you know, fix it weeks or days or uh, uh, where, you know, once a quarter, you'd stop doing work and everything else and you'd spend a week as a team, you know, tackling your, your tech debt backlog. Uh, I personally don't like that as much the, the the part that I did uh, that I usually do with all my teams, I call it twenty percent backlog. I borrowed twenty percent from my time at Google when uh, you know Google is famous on having twenty percent time, and I, I make sure that in every uh, depending on what development model you use, let's say sprints, or uh, you know in every sprint twenty percent of the team's capacity is going towards addressing that backlog, and then we have a separate process to kind of prioritize items on that backlog. So that way the team knows that. On a continuous basis, we're actually we're not just throwing this out in some you know black hole that we'll never uh, find again, but actually continuously trying to tackle that. And I find that, like I said, it, it helps the engineers build the trust that when we say we'll actually punt it, we you know there will be a time where, where that gets picked up. Uh, but more importantly, it speeds up the decision making. Interesting. And I've heard of a number of organizations that take that approach and I'll earmark some time for things. I'm curious about when you're working in that sprint based approach. Have you seen examples where something maybe some larger refactoring that needed to happen didn't get finished in that sprint? Does it kind of still continue existing and does it get passed to other people to finish it? And then how do you, or how do you think about that? Is it just like 
you're identifying a few people, like say you have a, a team of 10 people, I'm just throwing a hypothetical number out, and then like two people are just going to focus on the backlog of maintenance things, or is it like a percentage of time across the team? Yeah, no, you're asking a very good question, right? Because 20% is a, is a nice whole number, but it's really hard to implement in practice. Like, where, where do you actually draw that boundary? Um, I've, I've had it a, a few different ways, but none of it is perfect and really depends on, on the team dynamics. I've had it where we say, you know, 20%, so like every Friday, you just don't work on your tasks. We're working on the backlog. I've had it where we had a rotation. 10 people on the team, for example, two people will be on that rotation for that sprint and, and it keeps uh, changing. But, but in my opinion, I mean, the, the one that has worked best for me was just a matter of round-robining the tasks through the sprint and sprinkling them through. Because in reality, you know, you're not always going to be working on, you know, project-related or sprint-related tasks, and, and you're not always going to be uh, working on that tech debt task. So it's really hard to have a clear boundary. It's easier to know that, hey, you know, you got these things to work on, and then as an engineer, you have the autonomy to to figure out what works best for you and how to make those ends meet. Uh, we don't always hit the twenty percent sort of mark, but but you know it's it's close enough um, that I think it's it's still valid. I like that. In th- in terms of thinking around the you, the members of your team, feeling like there's a consistent time and place for when that stuff would be addressed. There's some consistency you can rely on. And you said it was kind of fostering some trust there and then giving them some of that autonomy to to address those things and prioritize those. I'm I'm assuming that doesn't just go to a like a product owner, or some other person that's not part of necessarily the one of the software developers. Like do are they prioritizing that themselves? And do you, how does that look like, you know, on a practical level? Are they do you have a separate meeting about them? Like here's the list of forty things we've compiled over the last few months and these two seem to be the the next things we should focus on? Yeah, yeah. So typically, um, depending on the team setup, I've had it where, say, the the tech lead on my team, whether it's a senior or staff engineer, um, you know, him and I would would sit down and, and prioritize that backlog. I've had it as frequently as on a monthly cadence if if we you know have more things there to that need to be addressed, and I've had it more you know happen once a quarter kind of thing. We'll be back with our interview with Ahmed in just a moment. Hi, it's me, Ravi. I just wanted to take a moment to say thank you for making time to listen to the Maintainable Software Podcast. If you're finding these discussions valuable, please consider sharing a link amongst your peers on social media like LinkedIn or Twitter or wherever kids are hanging out these days and or writing a review on Apple Podcasts to help spread the word. I want to touch on this Apple Podcast thing. I was listening to another podcast the other day and they're pleading their audience like, please write a review. But people, you may not know what you want to write in a review, but if you want to give us a two, three, four, five star review on Apple Podcasts, that'd be awesome. And as far as what you could put in the little description to say, my favorite episode was the one with Ahmed Wasfi or another one that you've listened to, or just say, I really like the, the host voice. It's unique. Whatever it is go over to Apple Podcasts and do that. I really appreciate it. Um, it helps other people see it, and you get it. You understand what I'm asking. I, I sound a little desperate. All right, let's get back to our interview with Ahmed Wasmi. So I'm going to pivot over to another topic that I was looking forward to speaking with you about, which is around your coaching practice for engineers who have recently been promoted to say, engineering manager, development team manager, whatever they might call it, their specific organization. And this is all via your the, the thriving EM. I'll, I'll include links in the show notes for everybody. First, do you believe all software engineers should go into management? I think it's a very personal choice, right? I, I think uh, managers being technical or having a technical background helps. But at the same time, I don't think it's for everyone. And and I don't think that's that's a super controversial opinion these days. But the typical thing that would happen is, you know, your your most productive engineer, your most senior engineer becomes the manager by default, which which is probably a, which is a horrible thing to do because you know you take a hit on on both, like one, on a very good engineer not doing engineering work anymore, and a very unskilled manager trying to manage the team with without building the management skill uh, in the past. So so there is that. But at the same time, you gotta you, you gotta be we have to be kind of honest with ourselves about sort of the, the implied status that, that we give to, you know, being a manager in, in society in general. 
you know, I've had it where people just wanted to be managers um, either because of kind of their, you know, cultural upbringing or sometimes even their families pressuring them to, to take that role. So you have some of those biases in play. A third one, which is more interesting, and I've been kind of actually, you know, recently discussing that with, with someone, it's, it's, it's also a numbers game in a sense, where if you look at your sort of staff and principal level uh, ICs, individual contributors, their numbers are not that high in, the, in a given organization versus the managers that would comparatively be at that same level if you have a parallel ladder for, for management. So you'd have more managers or, you know, um, what I call sort of M1s or M2s, you know, managing a team, first line managers or managing managers that would roughly translate to that kind of staff or principal level tier. You have more managers for those types of ICs. But then where it slims down again is like at the executive level, you know, directors and VPs, then it, it's it, it kind of, it's inverted again. So I've seen people actually pursue management just for that fact alone. Like it might be a lot harder for me to get to principal, say as an IC, but it's easier because there are more roles available. Again, I mean, ultimately, I think it's a very personal choice. Whatever drives you to it, you know, that's your call. Like, do it. But but the uh, that, that I care about at least more is making sure that you're competent if you're in that role. Whatever your motivations are, money, status, or you're actually passionate about it, you know, do it right. I'm sure people have heard of Alex Hormozzi. He's been all over social media these days. But one of the things he he talks about is you know, your work works more on you than, than you work on it. You actually get more out of, out of the work and out of the sort of the process of going through it than, uh, so, so it's, it's worthwhile to, to make it, um, to, to give it your all essentially. And, and that's, that's the part at least I care about the most. That's interesting. The, I'm glad you touched on the, like the cultural aspect and it's, you know, I think it's such a, I don't know where, you know, what, what your, what your upbringing was like. And I think there was this, in my own personal world, it was kind of like, I was always suspicious or skeptical of like leadership or management in some ways. So I'm like, I know better than they, they're just, I don't know what, I don't even know what they do all day for the most part. Right. But it was kind of like, I don't trust them in a word and maybe one day I'll get to become them and I'll do it the right way. Cause I was naive. And so there's kind of like this interesting thing that switched in my brain at some point, once I found myself, Oh, and now I'm all of a sudden like owning a company with employees. It's very different being like, Oh, maybe my past managers weren't so bad. And maybe a little bit more empathy for them in some ways too, but also like, I don't know what they knew what they're doing and I don't know what I'm doing most of the time. But anyways, um, let's get off that part of the train wreck of a deep dive that it might go into my own personal experience there. But I think that the thing that I wanted to like at least touch on is like, it's people feel like a certain level of like, well, I'm going to do this and one day I'll get to like, can I keep doing this type of like, if I'm going to write code every day, if I one day become a manager, then I can... And I'm really good software developer, but I become the manager. I can I can help pick the people that are going to be part of the team and you know help be a good mentor or whatever. But I don't know that there's always like a clear path. Like how do you gain those skills when you're doing a different set of skills? And then one day someone's offers you like, do you want to manage the other rest of the team? Because there's a void all of a sudden. So it's a I don't even know how that happens or I don't, I don't think there's a question there. But go yeah thoughts. <laughs> Yeah, no, that, you, 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 there's a couple of big points in, in what you just said. I mean, first off, I think I totally agree with you about how you think about managers and leadership changes as as you go through the process yourself. Uh, I think especially for, for technical folks uh, and engineers, that's the first thing they, they sort of are attached to. And you can't win. Um, like I remember not liking some of my uh, managers because they were not technical enough. And I'd be like, well, what does he know about the code? What does he know about X, or Y, or Z? But at the same time, you'd have the same reaction if they were really technical. Be like, "What? Well, that's not your job. That's my job. You focus on the management part. So you can't really win sometimes as a, as a manager there. But then as you get more experience, you actually start to you know, be more nuanced with, with how you criticize them. And you'd be like, oh, I really appreciate how they did that for the team or they knew how to sort of make sure the team's work is visible or fight for the right projects, et cetera, et cetera. So, so you start having a more, uh, I'd say, balanced uh, view of, of management as you as you go through it, which, which is interesting. It's, it's one of those things I think that it's hard to appreciate by just reading about it or learning about it. Sometimes you have to experience it uh, to, to get there. Your second point, I think it's, it's one of the things I, I get the most questions about from IC is how, how do I move from, from IC to management? And, and I can share my own experience and I could share sort of my high level, uh, you, you know, recommendation, but, but, but again, everybody's different and, and your mileage may, may vary. 
but yeah, I mean, for, for, for my own experience, so I one one very good way to look at your own personal values, I think, is is looking backwards and trying to trying to find patterns in 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 what you've done. And a couple of things that I have always stood out for me in, in terms of like all all of the job hops or the switches or or the projects that I've took on. One was around impact, and two was around learning. So uh, impact, you know, how much, you know, how much could I impact um, a particular product, a project, people, you know, around me. Uh, and I've been fortunate enough to be in, you know, multiple industries from healthcare to gaming to, to productivity to cloud. So it's, it's been it's been a fun ride, and there's always been that impact aspect to it. But also the learning aspect. When I, when I first started as an engineer, I was you know very curious to learn more and more about best practices and you know becoming a better engineer myself at some point at least for me it got to a point where things were slightly repetitive where you start to see the same patterns in some of the engineering problems that you tackle and the learning part wasn't as fun anymore but everything around how the project actually works the politics and, and the people of it more importantly started to fascinate me further and i was like cool i want i, I want to dig into that more and, and and you know that that's a more interesting thing and then it was during my time at Microsoft. So I was a, I was a senior engineer at Microsoft. I was part of the Office team. We, we had an interesting project with OneNote. We, we, you know, we could dig into the details in a bit, but OneNote was a note-taking app. Uh, and at the time, Microsoft was trying this experiment with having uh, flatter orgs. So my manager had something like 40 engineers reporting to him, which is insane. It does not scale at all. Quickly, he realized that doesn't work, so he did the next best thing, where he wanted to have tech leads on the team. He defaulted to the most senior folks to to be those tech leads. So uh, he asked me, you know, if I wanted to be one. Initially, I was against it, but he he kind of talked me into it. So that's when I started to see I'm actually impacting the work. It's not just me kind of mentoring or trying to do the right thing, but also I could help kind of structure the work and organize it and prioritize it in a, in a way where where I make sure we deliver value, and then. The learning part was was really interesting because people are different when you're a tech lead versus you're just a peer, um, and that part also fascinated me. And that was when I started seriously considering, okay, I'm I'm gonna start look, relying on that kind of uh, on my experience as a tech lead. Um, and and I made the switch to Amazon maybe a couple of years after you know after being a tech lead at Microsoft, and and uh, I've had you know the data points to kind of back back it up in in an interview setting. You know, something you were talk, you know, also touched on a little bit ago around there's kind of like a numbers thing where maybe there's more manager positions available than there are principal staff level um, roles within an organization. Do you feel like that trend will shift at some point? Like in fast forward 10 years from now, do you feel like there might be more upward mobility that still allows you to be an individual contributor in someone's career versus going down the management path? I don't know. It's you know hard to predict the future. If, if I had to bet, I, I I don't think it would it would change. It, it, just from again a pure numbers game, you always have you know junior and intermediate engineers that need you know some sort of support structure around them and some sort of help. So you, you'd always have you know first line managers in place to to help navigate some of that. These days, with with the tech layoffs, there's a lot of talk about. Um, I mean, Shopify just laid off a number of, of managers, for example, and uh, I've heard stories, none of them verified, about you know managers being asked to go back to being ICs, in some startups, given kind of the the just given the tech economy in general, I really don't see that trend continuing too long once we bounce back from from this. At least that's my opinion. Of course, I I could very well be wrong. Yeah, I I don't I don't have a prediction on that either. It's just. I didn't really thought about the numbers thing so much and that that's a, that could be a real thing. You know, another thing that's, I'm, I'm curious about the types of people that you are coaching, are they all kind of fitting in a very similar age bracket of some sort, or is it kind of like all over the map from your perspective? Yeah, no, it's, it's actually been uh, all over the map. So, I mean, uh, initially my goal was to help folks that just transitioned or, you know, you're very early on in your journey, first two years as being a manager kind of thing. At least, because that's you know that uh, that's where I felt I have the most value to offer. Uh, I've had folks that are I've actually had principal engineers that wanted to switch into management uh, much much later. Uh, I've had folks that have been managers for for a few years, have been managing multiple teams, and wanted help with um, just becoming a more effective leader in, in general. So so it's been slightly all over the map. It's one of those things where you know initially. 
I thought I, you know, that's the group that I could help best, but I think we could all learn from, from, from each other in different points of time. So, so uh, yeah, it just happened to be that some people found, found what I was teaching valuable as well. Yeah. The, I think one of the things in our, our industry that I don't feel like we talk a lot about is ageism, you know, is, a, is this a thing? And it's like, I don't think people are like openly talking about, like, I don't want to hire an older person to be on our team or, and whatever their rationale for that is. But like, I feel like there, I've, I've, I've spoken with people and I've seen people, you know, say, say this when I'm interacting with them at meetups or conferences. And they're like, there's a little bit of like, wow, this person applied for a job, but I think they've been around too long that it's going to be hard for them to like, there was like a worry that they're not going to be able to pick up some new piece of technology because they've been working with other technology for the past 35 years. And I'm just like, that's a really interesting way to think about it. But I'm like, that's seems naive. Like, what's your take on that? Do you feel like that's a thing that we should be talking more about and like addressing, like moving some of those uh, biases in our hiring practices? Yeah, I mean, I just saw your your tweet about the 35 years being old and on Quora. <laughs> uh, but uh, I, I, it's it's just like any other bias. I think the more you talk about it, the more you shine a light on it. I think the better things will be overall. The, the problem with with hiring biases in general, it's it's very hard to actually to track that the right progress is being made. And and uh, f- for different reasons, companies are not very transparent with why they made a decision that they made. And it's it's harder to get into the details about like was it actually due to to a hidden bias or are you just Justifying your bias by by using you know another proxy for for it. I, I've I've you know I've I've had it the other way where I've I've been on teams where people will you know would tell me you don't you're too young to be a manager and I'd be like well I'll, you know maybe but uh, but I am and I've I've had it you know I had one experience in particular where it was a is an older SDE that joined the team and they were uh, they, they had white hair and and people immediately kind of um, uh, questioned kind of exactly what you're saying. Like, could they pick up things quickly enough? Could they actually uh, do things at the right pace? So it's, I think it's definitely there. It's definitely one of those kind of hidden biases to, that we don't really question as much. I don't have a solution, but but I think the more you talk about it, the, the better the better it will be. It, the, the thing that I always think about is even like, you might talk about someone that has a lot of experience and has been in the industry for a long time. But there's also people that have a lot of experience in other industries and they weren't a software developer and they, they're all of a sudden, say, in their 50s, 60s maybe even, looking for a career shift and want to become like a junior developer. And it's just like this interesting thing where they don't know that that's what the what we all imagine and we think and like, oh, why would we hire this person that's older? You know, and, and I'm not saying that I would do that. It's just like, but it's, it is a, it's, a, it's a thing that happens and I, I want to make sure that we're being encouraging and inviting to you know people of all spectrums of different walks of life and stuff into, into this industry because you can be a junior developer in your 50s or you know in your early 20s and be just as good in either way right yeah yeah no it reminds me of that movie the intern right That's right it's yeah but i mean ultimately though i think it's it's no matter where you are like you got to prove that you are actually adding value no matter how old you are no matter what industry you're in right so it's harder to do that when when there are kind of biases in place, but that's why the there's a lot of talk about sort of um, there's a lot of books about like your first ninety days in a job and how important it is to actually prove yourself there. But one of the very interesting sort of spins on that is our uh, our own confirmation bias co- comes into play there because if within the ninety days you prove yourself to be a um, sort of a superstar or you could actually and I hate using the term superstar but if you if you prove that you add a lot of value. And then that's the initial impression kind of people take. Even if you screw up later on, their own confirmation bias would look for the positives in what you're doing. So that will sort of carry you through. So, so regardless of how old you are or you know, what industry you join, you still need to add value. And, and I would say especially during those first 90 days, because then that, that compounds in your favor over time. That's, that's a good point. I think anyone listening that's about to join a new organization that's some some sage advice there for thinking about how you're going to go and make an impact. And I also just want to say, if, if, you, if you're listening out there and you're struggling in those first 90 days and it's due to something that the organization's not facilitating or they're not pointing you in the right direction or helping you be successful, you should definitely speak, speak up about that and not just pushing forward because in burying your head in, in the issue, whatever, and for too long either, as well. So I've seen people come in to my own organization where they kind of start flailing a little bit. They don't want... 
that perception to get kind of messed up. And so, and then we're like, what happened to you the last two, three, couple of weeks, you know? And that, that becomes like a different sort of, you know, seed of I mean, like when it could have been something like, oh no, we screwed up. We didn't give you the right documentation. We could have pointed you in the right direction quicker. If you had asked, this would have been a 15 minute conversation. And it was like, oh yes, that should have been updated. Sorry about that. Um, so it's, it's a shared. No, I agree. And I've, I'm seeing more and more of that in this post COVID remote first world. Uh, and, and I have a few engineers on my own teams do the same where, you know, they're fresh out of school, they, they join a team and then they want to sort of, for whatever reason, appear to be better than the FVR and, and try and kind of go at it alone and, and fight it solo. When, when, like you said, like, if, you know, a few simple questions would have saved them uh, weeks of, uh, of time. And, and that's another interesting tangent to do kind of work from home and, and remote work. But, but I think it definitely, it definitely it's hurting the, the junior folks more, I would say. And I, I don't have any data to back this up, but I think it'll, it'll be interesting to see how long it takes sort of a, like you get somebody fresh out of college and how long it takes them to be kind of, you know, a seasoned, you know, more senior engineer, for instance, working fully remotely versus somebody in a sort of a, where they're working in an office where they get to interact more with, with their peers. And I'm willing to bet that long-term uh, remote first would hurt at least the more junior folks. And But I know that's a debate and that's, uh, a few people are now bad, mad at me that I just said that probably. But Yeah. And I, you know, I, I share that perspective and we do hire junior people and it was much easier when we're all in an office to see someone struggling, go up and be like, Hey, how's it going over here? I saw you've been looking at Stack Overflow for a while. Uh, do you need some, do you need to talk? Uh, let's, let's, let's hash this out. You can't see that happen and we don't need to like, you know, you can get into a conversation about like uh, surveillance culture in an organization, but you could just see your coworker is struggling a little bit and I don't feel like you can see that as easily and it takes someone having to be like raise a hand or ask for help in a Slack message or something like, Hey, do you have a few minutes? And let's please do that. Cause that's the Avenue you can do right now, but it's just, but it, it is sometimes you're kind of like hitting your head against the wall for a while, you know, or your monitor, then you should probably speak up and sooner than later. Definitely. All right. Let's, I want to switch topics. There's definitely a couple things I wanted to definitely make sure we have time to, to talk about. So you know, for those listening who've been thinking about going, to, you know, you mentioned this very individual track. Do you think there's some, you know, you mentioned like a tech lead type roles. For those that don't aren't in that role yet, or what are some things you could advise the people if they want to start dipping their toes into the idea of maybe one day going into management, but they're not there now and they're an individual contributor? What sort of things could they be doing? Right. Yeah, I, I think at a at a high level, um, th- there's probably a couple of big things they they can try to do. And, and, and it, all, it all comes down to trying to acquire the skills that will uh, convince the prospective employer that you actually will be a successful manager, right? And I think the easiest, uh, there, there are two broad categories in my mind. One is project leadership. And the other one is people management or people leadership naturally, right? But the I think the easy one is project leadership first, because it's very easy to sort of improve your existing process in a team, whether you step up to to help run some of the sprints or stand-ups or assist with project planning and, and that sort of thing, or, you know, fill the gaps, talk to different teams and, and try to do some of the work needed for a successful project execution, even if there is an existing role today, but obviously talk to them, see how you could help. That would help you get that that experience. And, and especially when for, for teams that do, you know, in kind of scrum based, you know, whether they're running kind of traditional scrum or some variation of it, it's very easy to find gaps in your existing scrum process and, and things to do about it. You know, I've had uh, I had this recently in one of my teams where one of my engineers, she actually stepped up to run our sprint retrospectives. Spotify publishes these really cool kind of retro templates that, that they use for for those and, and you know, she, she brought it into our org and, and we kept using it and it was actually a pretty valuable addition. So so things like that, I think, would be the easiest to get. The other side about people management, I think that one is uh, is harder to get directly, but there's always proxies for it. For example, a lot of teams hire interns where you can, um, you can manage that intern directly. Um, um, usually you could mentor uh, uh, more junior engineers that join on board them. Especially in larger companies, there's usually a mentorship, you know, system or framework where you could actually sign up to be a mentor and, and start mentoring people across the org. So that gives you some of some of those people leadership aspects. Obviously, not not to the full extent you'd want, 
uh, depending on how long you've been in the org and how senior you are, Ofsee managers rely heavily on senior ICs to get performance feedback on other individuals uh, because they're closer to them. They you know they they work with them on a daily basis. So if you if you get that kind of experience, that gives you another sort of angle into uh, people management and and performance management and and how that works. Um, so so I think those those are some of the um, uh, kind of obvious ones you can take. The hardest one is opportunity, right? So you do all this, you have the skills, you, you, you know, you, you have some data points to prove it. Now we need to find an opportunity where there's actually an open management position that you can actually, you know, tackle. In a way, I think you, you make your own luck by, by you know, it's a numbers game, right? You, you, tr- you try and, and, in my opinion, you try and force it uh, if, you, if that's really what you want. Um, and there's, you know, two, you know, two big ways to, to force that opportunity. One, tell everyone in your org that you're after a management position, uh, so that at least you'd be concerned for one if, if one comes up or if, you know, if there's an upcoming one, which happens a lot more often than you think. Um, uh, you know, leadership is constantly talking about org structures and, you know, how to make things better, more efficient. And there could be talks about, about those going on you're just not aware of. And then two, natu- the natural next option is applying externally. Some companies would be more, you know, more, more willing or um, to take a chance on somebody with no formal management experience and, it's just up to you to find those and, and, and convince them essentially. I, that's I like that idea of going around just being very public about it within your organization. Like this is what I want to do. I'm, you know, this is the track I want. This is my goal. And if it's a supportive environment, they should pay attention to that and, 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 and think about that and, you know, and, and be honest, if there's not probably going to be an opportunity within that organization, hopefully they would can tell you that as well or tell you what you need to do to get to that point where they feel like they could, Let's, let's transition you over that, you know, because I often wonder about how, how many managers, I feel like it's probably a lot better than it used to be 15, 20 years ago, where you're the software engineer on the team that's most productive or perceived to be most productive, and the organization trusts, leadership trusts your opinion on things. You seem to have a good read on your coworkers, and so they're like, here, can you be a manager because we lost our manager or we didn't have a manager necessarily, and, and thinking, like, I'm just going to get the, the best developer we could possibly have on our team. So we can get more of that, right? And then we'll just they'll, they'll just tr- teach everybody else how to be as great as them. It doesn't always happen quite like that. So that's that that's I think the reality we've all I think hopefully all accepted at this point. Given the point in time we are at, and you mentioned like Shopify just recently had layoffs as well, and like you know given that the industry has had been subjected to a lot of layoffs in the last I don't know six plus months or so now, I'm curious to get your thoughts on a few kind of questions. For, so for those listening that might be a manager right now. How can managers kind of, like you say, uh, maybe effectively address the impact and concerns for the the team after experience layoffs? Like, how do you how do you navigate that? Like, what what advice do you have if they've never been in that scenario before? Yeah, I mean, it's it's a uh, it's honestly a tough position. I I wish there was, uh, and like with, I think it's similar with a lot of the management topics. There isn't sort of a one size fit, fits all. Um, my advice was you know, to start by being transparent about it. Um, you know, we, we can't sort of dodge the, the real issue or, or, or the actual impact. And especially if you've had sort of teammates that, that were impacted, but, you know, acknowledge, you know, what happened, acknowledge what they're going through, but also be very transparent about what you can share and what you can't share. In a lot of cases, depending on how high up you are, you actually don't know until the last minute. Uh, so, so be kind of very transparent with that. The other piece is, I'd say, cut your team some slack, right? Like it's, they're going through an emotional ro- roller coaster and you got to be conscious of that as they're going through it. Also try and spin it positively and, and try and focus on the positives and, and, you know, if you can get the team together, because I think being together in person or if you can, then virtually and, and try and kind of look for how to unite the team again after, um, after what happened. Um, but I, I understand it's it's a lot more difficult than you know, you know it's it's easy to, to talk about some tips and tricks, but yeah, I, I wish there was an easy answer around it, but I unfortunately I don't I don't think there is. Yeah, I don't know that we get a lot of um practice at this until it happens, right? And so it's like uh we talk about like hiring and firing people because they're not maybe a good fit for the organization or whatever, but then like when there are people that seemingly are good fits and they get let go and then there's people that are still left on the team being like why them and not me or, you know, or 
should I start looking for a new job? And those are like the things I'm like, you know, as a manager and as an owner of a company, you know, when things like that happen, you're kind of like, it's hard not to worry a little bit like, well, who might leave now? And then like, but are there enough job opportunities out there for people to go? And like, what's going to keep them to stay? It's complicated. It's messy. It really is. It really is. And, and, and you're right. Like, especially as a, you know, as a, as an owner of a business or, or as a manager, you ideally you'd want to keep your team. But if you're being kind of perfectly transparent and honest with them, uh, you know, and, and, I, and I've, I've had, I mean, I've just had to, Amazon just went through a couple of rounds of layoffs and I've had to tell the same thing to, to my teams. Focus on the pieces that you can control. And that includes looking outside. Like I, I'd want to keep you on the team, but in, in some cases, I don't know what's going to happen. And I cannot, you know, in, in kind of in full consciousness, sit here and say, you know what, you're going to keep your job 100% guaranteed because I don't know if I'm keeping my own job, right? So the pieces you can control is, you know, one of them at least is hedging your bets. And, and, and sometimes that's, that's what you can do. So it's easy if you don't know, because then you could be fully transparent with them and be like, hey, but then if you know, but, you know, the decision hasn't been made yet, then I think that's, that's more complicated. And that's where you kind of need to don't break any of your own kind of personal values or don't break that trust with the individual. But at the same time, try and be uh, honest with them and try and keep things at, as positive as you can within the bounds of, hey, let's focus on the pieces we can control. And, and we get, what, one of those every 15-ish years, roughly. And, and maybe that, for a lot of people, it's, it's their first time going through it. So it's, so it's difficult. It's a, it's a little bit of a roller coaster at times, this whole career thing. You know, it kind of leads over to another thing, you know, kind of segues over to team member recognition. And in particular, do you find that people you work with tend to struggle with being able to give recognition to their team members or their peers? And I say this as someone that's like, I've received feedback from people on my teams in the past that I don't give enough positive praise because I always seem to be pointing out when maybe something doesn't look right or I, you know, and so I mean, then like, then I reflect on my own experience in my career. I'm like, I don't feel like I've ever really had a good manager that was really, I've never seen that exhibited necessarily. Like what does, what are people looking for? So for the people that you're working with, do they struggle with that a little bit as well? Or am I just kind of like this psychopath that probably needs to get some help? No, you're definitely not alone. <laughs> I think it's mostly kind of in how our minds are, you know, uh, trained and as engineers, you know, you lock, you look for the fault, right? Like how can the system break? How can we actually figure out how to fix it? How do we mitigate that risk? So I think it's in a way, you know, a side effect of just how you were trained in, uh, as an engineer. Uh, I think the, the, the research says the magic number is something like 3.2 to one. So like 3.2 positive reinforcements to, to one negative or critical comment. Uh, that's kind of a healthy average to try and, and hit. What, what has worked for me and, and for some of the folks that have, that have helped kind of coach is a combination of one kind of having your own uh, system in place where like for me, I just keep it super simple. I have a notepad or just, you know, a note stock that's open in the background throughout the week, I'll be noting positive things that I just see from others on my team. And I'll either bring them up in a one-on-one -on -one or I'll just, you know, point it out in a Slack message if it's quickly enough. Having that open just forces me to think about it um, every day. When I look at it, it'll be like, oh, you know, so-and-so, there are no bullets under their name yet. I, I probably need to look for, for, for other bullets. Uh, and then the other, si the other side of it is try and encourage that as a, as a team or make that more of a cultural thing. Funny enough, Google has this idea of peer bonuses where I think you sent like a, forget the exact numbers, like $100 or something, $150 per peer bonus. And you get five of those a quarter to, to send out to anyone when they do something you think is worthy of a peer bonus. And most people do not use it. Most people will, will just have their peer bonuses unused and they don't give them out. Google's, you know, Google's way of trying to encourage that culture was, was trying to, you know, have that peer bonus system, but still, still people wouldn't do it. So, so what, I mean, what I try to do at least is in, you know, in retrospectives, that's the first thing we do. Um, and I think that's a very common template, you know, just recognize kudos or whatever to, to, to folks that have done a good job and, and try and build that into, into the culture. But yeah, I, I think those are the two things, mechanisms that have worked for me in the past uh, and still do to this day. But That's interesting. I'm, I think around team members that are, you know, especially if you're a little bit maybe a couple layers back from in some way. So I'm in like a, you know, we have like a 16 person company right now and I'm not the engineering manager. We have developers that are, have a manager. And then sometimes I'm like, well, I'm not really 
that close to like the day-to-day work that's happening. So unless I'm like meddling, you know, in some ways I'm like, I'm almost like back to the surveillance thing. I'm like, what's going on in this Slack channel? Like what's, what are we working on? Maybe look at these Jira tickets and stuff like that. And then, so it feels a little weird for me to probably think like, I need to go around and find some positive feedback for everybody in my, in my organization. I do need to do that. That's part of my job and, and that's important for their own professional growth as well. But but I, I've I've seen other engineering managers and people feel like, well, I don't really, I'm not that low level with them. So am I supposed to give them specific feedback on how they're approaching PRs or they're, how they're helping another coworker? Or is it just that the teams are giving each other kudos? And so it's, it's an interesting thing to kind of navigate and try to like wrap your head around, like coming up with a good system. I like that the notepad idea, just having something just to remind yourself, like this is something I, I need to be doing throughout the week. Uh, right. And, and it's honestly like... It's easy to overthink your way out of it. It's like, oh, is this like good enough? Is this? Good? I mean, my, my advice would be when you start just any positive thing. Like it could be a PR, it could be a, a you know design doc, it could be a comment they made in a meeting. It could be anything, and and I think every little bit helps. And then as you get better at it, you could start to filter those a little bit more. But early on, I'd say don't don't sort of pre-filter. It's harder, like you say, when you when you're more removed, or if you're you know if you're managing managers or you know having a larger team. You know, ideally, I would say develop your leaders to to fill those shoes. One thing I I find that helps in in those cases, and engineers are really good at sort of quantifying, uh, you know, how we feel. Uh, so I like to ask, uh, like, if you have like skip level one and ones, for example, uh, and sometimes even in regular one and ones, I, I like to ask them to rate their happiness on a scale of one to ten. And I don't ask that every time, but engineers are re- very good at kind of coming up with a quantifying how they feel, and in general. That gives you an overall impression of how things are going, and it's just another way of, for you maybe with a much longer feedback loop, uh, track kind of the trends overall. I like that idea. Um, I literally have a skip level meeting with someone in an hour and a half, so um, I'm doing it every six months. It's something we started doing about six months ago, so it's the second time coming through there. But I like that idea. I'm going to throw that question awesome. at them. Yeah, and I love that question because then you could be like, "Why is it not higher? Why is it not lower?" or an even better way to phrase it is like, oh, that's weird. I expected it to be lower. And then they, they would talk to you about like why it's not lower. And like they'll mention a lot of positive things usually if you phrase it that way. But you know. And then um, I've also learned like the superpower phrases. Tell me more. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Just, and then say it again. And then like it, it, that just starts to open up a bunch of uh, things that people wouldn't normally open up about. Hi there. We hope you're enjoying this week's episode of Maintainable. While you've been listening, has anyone crossed your mind who might be looking for help with their Ruby on Rails application? Planet Argon, the producer of Maintainable Podcast, would love to meet them. In fact, we've got a pretty sweet referral bonus program set up. If you send someone our way and they sign up for Planet Argon services, we'll give them a $1,000 discount. And your reward? We'll send you $1,000 just for connecting us to the right person. Sounds like a win-win for everyone. Head on over to planetargon.com forward slash referrals for more info. That's planetargon.com forward slash referrals. All right, let's get back to this week's episode. So a couple of quick last questions for you, Ahmed. Let's imagine there's a few software developers listening right now, and they've been at the companies for a few years, and they don't feel like their concerns around, say, long-term maintainability have been heard by management or, the, I'm air quoting, the product people or whoever is deciding and controls the, the purse strings. Perhaps they've tried a few times to advocate for some refactoring, of uh, maybe improving the test suite, upgrading the framework they're using, but I've heard not right now a few too many times. Aside from recommending that they go look for a new job, what advice would you give them today on how they can start taking some action? Very good question. Uh, and I've, yeah, we've had something very similar. Uh, uh, one note when you know I, I, try, I, I let a product modernize our, our stack without going into too much detail, but, but, but you're right. I think there's they're sort of, you either play victim and you complain about it and do nothing, go, you know, getting up and leaving, which I think is an equally easy option. I think the hard part is, is to actually try and actually change something. The, the way uh, I'll, I'll talk about my, my experience, and, and I think you know it could apply to, to others as well. But in, in the OneNote days, and, and just maybe for context, uh, you know, if we, if we have a couple of extra minutes, I could talk about that. But as part of Office Online, like Office 365, 
Uh, it's a monolithic code base with Word, Excel, and OneNote. But one of the annoying things, like it would take four hours to build the entire code base. Um, it would take an order of minutes to actually make a front end change. So you're doing, it was written in script sharp, which is a, an internal language that looks very similar to C sharp, but then gets transpiled into JavaScript to run in a browser. But engineering velocity was super slow as a result of that. It would take weeks to deploy that to production because you had to test a bunch of Office uh, you know, products with it. And everyone was not happy that we had the same problem we needed to change, but seemingly not no response. So, so a couple of things I tried to do. Look, one, in fairness, I had a supportive manager that gave me the autonomy to do some of those things, so that, that's important. But also try to find a business win or a business deliverable that would actually uh, that, that, you, that you could tag these things to. And then two, I would say find the, the smallest piece that you could tackle and actually deliver value in first and to show kind of proof that this this works and, and how that more importantly would improve some of the bigger metrics. So in, in our case, we decided to, um, again, without going into a lot of details, get a single component. So think of think of Office, you know, if, you know, if you think of the Office toolbar, there's a bunch of icons, like pick one, for example. It, it was more complicated than that, but but for the sake of this example, pick one and, and modernize it or, or change it, or like that was the piece we picked at the time, just to show the value. And we actually had data that showed both kind of what we called inner loop, like how how much developer velocity improved um, if they're working on that component, and then how long it would take us to actually test it independently and deploy it to was, think of it as microservices, but for the for the front end development world. Um, so we had data to back that up and, and show the savings in sort of in, in dev uh, months when if we were to apply that more more broadly. And then the second piece is tagging it to an an ongoing project. At the time, OneNote there was a big project around kind of a UX overhaul and, and trying to redesign the look and feel of, of the app. And we showed how much faster things could be if we, at the time it was in React, if we built it, built it in React versus rely on the old kind of script shop way of doing things. When we did that combination of, you know, showing that it works and then proving to our product managers with numbers that we could actually develop this thing a lot faster, uh, that's when we start getting more traction behind it and, and more wins. So your first response you get is likely to be a no or likely to be a, we'll do it later. But Try and find those little kind of wins and 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 I'm pushing through. Th- th- at least that, that would be my advice. And then, and then if all else fails, leaving is the easiest option. Like it, like I said, I like that around just focusing on trying to finding say some business value or business win. Uh, like look, this is in being able to quantify that, especially for larger projects like that. If you're able to do that, I think sometimes it gets a little fuzzier for some small organizations where they're like, like I have a th- my gut says this is going to drastically save us more time or it's going to be remove barriers for me. And I assume for my peers, but it's, I think that can be an interesting self. You can't figure out how to pull together some data or metrics to kind of logically have that conversation versus, you know, kind of feeling a subjective, like I will just be in a better mood every day if you allow me to do this, you know, and that's can be a harder sell. It doesn't mean it's not a worthy thing to also address. Right. Yeah. And yeah, no, you're right. And in those cases, I, I would say, you know, try and find, you know, proxy metrics or an estimates as much as you can. Um, even if you just look at sort of, you look into like your Jira or whatever ticket management system you've got and, and look at lead times for, for different things and, and come up with reasonable assumptions about how things would change after what you propose happens. Again, again there are assumptions, but some data is better than, than just a gut feel. That's true. Is there a non-software, non-technical book that you find yourself recommending to people? Yes. I mean, I, I love that question. And um, I think my answer would change depending on when you ask me. But at least today, it would be um, a, book, a book called Mastery by George Leonard. So th- there's a couple of mastery books. I, I don't mean the um, uh, the Robert Greene one, but the, the one I'm talking about is co- by George Leonard. It's a very short book, I think 100 pages or so. But he essentially talks about the process of mastering a skill and how you only do it by just being in it for the long term just for the sake of mastering the skill and he talks about different types of people you've got kind of people that dabble in and just give up or people that start strong and then at the you know first sign of resistance kind of give up it's a very interesting book and he talks about his experience learning a martial art and how um, sometimes in your journey to mastery you have long periods of plateaus where you, you think you're not going anywhere uh, but then all of a sudden there's a big jump and, and you keep going. Very, very uh, interesting and informative book. Uh, definitely recommend it. 
great. I'll definitely include links to that in the show notes and also to the Thriving EM for folks listening. And so where, aside from the Thriving EM, where else can people follow your thoughts and ruminations and ideas about software engineering and management online? Yeah, so I mean, the, the Thriving EM, EM I've, I've got a, a mailing list people could sign up for where we have a newsletter, um, you know, that we send out. So that's that's one way. The other way is my own Instagram profile. I actually publish uh, reels mostly related to engineering management, but a lot of ICs find them useful as well. We can link my, my account in the, in the show notes as well. Excellent. I definitely will we'll include everything in the show notes for everybody. And with that, it's been such a delight having you join us on Maintainable. Ahmed, thank you so much for stopping by to talk shop. Thank you. I really enjoyed this. Thanks a lot, Ravi. Mm-hmm.